Uh, I do want to thank Shomer, as I said before, and I want to thank the laymans who I think are still in Israel. They wrote me the other day for our the series sponsors, as you can see tonight. We have Steve Kaplan in honor of his parents, and Howard's actually manning one part of our tech team. Uh, you know, uh, he, he stepped into big shoes. Next, we, next week is Jake Shulchman's yard site. You know, it, it was that night, that, if you remember. But Bar Hashem, he, you know, he's filled those shoes. So uh, thank God for the Kaplan's. We need one more sponsor, I think, one and a half. So if anybody's interested in helping out, we, uh, you know, I have all of them covered except for one and a half. Uh, now, I do want to call attention once again to the Israel trip that's coming up. It's firming up, and uh, we're getting a nice group together, uh, normal people. And if anybody's interested, well, it doesn't always work out that way, let me tell you. <laughs> Would you like to hear the story of that? <laughs> Shame on you, after Yom Kippur. Now, um, anyhow, but uh, I do, uh, we are going to do a one week of a fairly intense Jewish history stuff in Israel. And uh, if you're interested, you'll get in touch with me. Truth is, I'm handing over all the details to my son. So he's the one that's going to fill everybody in if anybody's interested in that. Uh, I encourage people to come, but only if you're normal. If you're not, stay out. And finally, I ain't got no time for these weirdos. He says, and finally, um, I do want to thank our tech team as always. See, they're here, they're ahead of me. They really deserve your applause more than anything else. And without any further ado, we'll get underway. We're in the Winter Lecture Series of 2022 to 2023. Uh, the name of the series, as you know, is Oslo Immigration Assassination, the State of Israel and the Jewish People, 1992 to 96. Uh, tonight is the second lecture, I guess. And that would be the New Rabbin Government and the Oslo Peace Process, Part 2. The truth is, by the time I finish writing this all up, you could even make a Part 3, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I want to subject myself to that. But we'll, we'll work it all in. Uh, and the truth is, because a lot of it is so much depending on the background, so here we go. As we saw last week, by say 1980 or so, everybody favored an end to the occupation and a solution to the Palestine situation. As you can see, all the was, you know, all the big people, Secretary of State, the, the potential Secretary of State, time and life, the New York Times, the whole gang, okay? The only person that was just, except for one passionate guy, did not subscribe to the end of the occupation and, um, and the idea of a solution to the Palestinian situation. Now, Menachem Begin was a gift to the PLO in terms of political affairs. I don't know if you remember this, but he came across as a turn off to many because of extreme Zionism. He made Zionism look bad. On the other hand, Begin did have a large block, domestic block of uh, followers, as we know, uh, take a look at the next one. I just picked this up to the It's in front of a huge crowd. זאת העיר ההיסטורית, ירושלים שלנו, שהיא בירתנו, אחת ויחידה, לעולמי עד ולנצח נצחים. <אז> והיא את כל השטחים שביהודה ובשומרון עדי הגבור שהיה קיים עד הרביעי ביוני 1967 והגבול היה נקרא הקו הירוק ואני יכול לבשר לכם בכל הפשטות שהקו הירוק אף הוא נעלם, איננו, אינו קיים, אינו שריר, לא ישוב עוד לעולמים. Don't fall for the fact that they're going to cut a deal with Hussein because he's going to want everything back, including East Jerusalem, and you're going to give all this back. And basically, they hold the Jewish people have no historical homeland whatsoever, and we're going to go back to the 67 borders, and you know what that means. Now, the point is, I just at the time, I'm a little under the weather, as you can see. Uh, but, I mean, he had a lot of followers, as you know. 
Now, Begin even had a base of support in American Jewry, ironically, right? With the Christians. That's uh, his biggest hustle with Jerry Falwell. So he, my point is that in the late 70s and 80s, he was able to resist that kind of pressure uh, to end the occupation and turn into a Palestinian state of one storm or another. But during Begin's time, and he was in office from 77 for six years to 83, important sections of American Jewish elites came to adopt views which were the opposite of Begin. These guys embraced the woke views of Paris and the Labor Party because that made life easier for those elites. So if you're head of the American Jewish Committee or the Congress or this or that and the other, and you're ever accosted by anybody say, oh, I'm, I don't agree with the uh, extreme policies of Begin. We favor a two-state solution or whatever the kind of language is, and then you get a pass, okay? It's also true that a lot of them bought into this idea, which is that the problem lies in Israel's intransigence. I'll repeat again, that the problem lies in Israel's intransigence. The problem is not on the other side, <laughs> you see? And uh, like I said before, you have an easier life in, uh, in, in outside of Israel if you go with that. Now, um, it was strange but true that people like Begin had more traction with Jerry Falwell than with a lot of American big shots. Uh, and we know this. So the liberal Jews, I mean, this is like the Trump thing, you know, the liberal Jews were less supportive of the policy of the Israeli government at that time than, uh, than, all, than the Christian conservatives. Okay? Now, Begin, however, as we know, wrecked his own prestige by number one, the Lebanon war and screwing up the hyperinflation. You know, he, he made a mess of it. That's the bottom line. But even after Begin left office in disgrace, but still loved by his followers, the Likud, as we saw last time, remained a very big party, especially because the Sephardim were growing as a percentage of the electorate all the time. So before the Ruski showed up in Israel about a million of them, the demographic trends were totally in the direction that the Ashkenazi wasps are going to get smaller and smaller because they have one or two kids, because they adopt Western patterns. And the more traditional side, I didn't say the Orthodox, the traditional side, your Jews from the Eidon and Mizrach are going to get more and more. And for a whole bunch of reasons, they supported the Likud. And therefore, if you ever read Israeli prognosticators in the 1980s, for example, they said the sky is falling. You know, tomorrow is going to be worse because the Likud is only going to get bigger and bigger and the Yonahs are going to get smaller and smaller. Okay? Now, the bottom line is the Sephardim who had lived among the Arabs, they didn't trust the Palestinians. You see? So they know. So you're what I call wasp types who never had to engage in that especially if you're an American Jewish liberal, so you're just being liberal from far away, or British or French, so they could create, honestly, in their minds, the idea that the problem is Israeli intransigence, and that if you get rid of the Israeli intransigence, you'll find Arabs on the other side willing to uh, negotiate in good faith, and you'll create a Switzerland for tomorrow, and you'll solve the Arab-Israeli problem. That's how it goes. But the you couldn't tell that to people who had immigrated from Morocco, from Iraq, and places like that, because the truth of the matter is even before 48, the Jews did not have a great over there, despite the propaganda that they tell you all the time. Most people are not historians to go into the actual details of what life was like in the Ottoman Turkish Empire and these other places, but it wasn't a, a, a bowl of cherries the way a lot of people would make you think today. Thus, the Likud under Shamir in the 1980s blocked any moves, as we saw last week, towards the withdrawal from the Shtachim in the decade of 1983 to 1992. Now, the Likud thought that they succeeded in putting the kibosh on any withdrawal from the Shtachim, but all they really did was kill the Jordanian option. Okay? As I said, in the middle of the 1980s, when Shimon Peres was in power, and I don't want to cause that all over again, but they, remember they had that government of 84 to 88, in which they was, both parties cooperated, but both parties also worked e behind each other's back. So I'm talking about the years 86 to 88, when Shamir was the prime minister, but Shimon Peres was the foreign minister. And uh, Peres and his team got the idea that we can bypass the Palestinians and deal directly with King Hussein, 
and we'll give the West Bank over to him and the Gaza Strip with the idea that he will guarantee a peaceful border. So what we're really saying is that the Jordanian army will come in. They are tough, no question about it, the police and all that. Uh, and if anybody tries to make a terrorist attack in Israel, they will stop it. That's, that's the basic idea. And they're a real government, so you have somebody to talk to. This is an idea that Paris came up with. Um, it had been around. And he personally, secretly negotiated with um, King Hussein in London. Uh, this is, uh, the guy on the right is a very famous British lawyer, Lord Mishkan, a guy in the Labor Party, a very big attorney, and he knew King Hussein, and uh, the kids went to school together and things like that. And the result was that he arranged that you should, that, you know, secretly that Paris and him should negotiate over, uh, you know, in, in their house in London and maybe hammer out a deal. That's what it boiled down to. Paris was very proud of this, and he said, we did it in such a way that we can guarantee that nothing will go bad for Israel. The others say, you're crazy, and there's no guarantee whatsoever. And this is what they call the Jordanian option. Here I found uh, online that Netflix now has a, 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 a Paris biography, hagiography. And there's a part where he tells how he did it and what a great thing it was. And I, I you know, I don't want to knock him in the sense of saying that he's, you know, a bum or anything, because like, he certainly was not. But he, but he had, you know, he, it's just weird to me, and it will remain weird that all these smart people, you know, didn't see what a dumbbell like myself could see. But l l let's see how he puts it. Shimon Peres becomes deputy prime minister and foreign minister, and he quickly focuses on a new goal: a peace treaty with Jordan and with King Hussein's assistance a solution to the ongoing conflict with the Palestinians. What was the idea? That we shall have three entities, the Jordanian Kingdom, the State of Israel, and the West Bank that was under the Jordanian rule. The West Bank will be not really completely independent. The Jordanian King and our government will manage together the West Bank. Whoever lives in all those places, if he's the Israeli, will vote for the Israeli parliament. If he's the Jordanian, vote for the Jordanian kingdom. Everybody can move to wherever he wants. There wouldn't be any problem of settlements. There wouldn't be any problem about holy places. Because this happened. In a historic speech to the General Assembly of the United Nations, Shimon Peres offers to enter into direct negotiations with the Hashemite kingdom. The speech is received positively and initiates a secret dialogue between King Hussein and Paris, supported by the United States. April 1987, the King and Shimon Peres are on their way to a clandestine meeting in London. Prime Minister Shamir refuses to take the meeting seriously. Why is Shimon doing this, he remarks. Nothing will come of it. The meeting is facilitated by a prominent member of London's Jewish community, Victor Mishkan, who's friendly with King Hussein because their children are going to school together. We met on a Saturday morning, the home of Mishkon. Lady Mishkon sent all the stuff out. She prepared herself the lunch, the dinner, breakfast, without any servants. The talks go on throughout the day. After Mrs. Mishkon prepares dinner for the group, the King and Perez take an unusual break from the talks. The king says, Mrs. Mishkon is working so hard. Let the two of us go and wash the dishes. To which I agreed uh, quickly. After another two hours of discussion, the king and Shimon are in full agreement on the major points of what will soon be called the London Agreement. Perez immediately returns to Israel so he can meet with Prime Minister Shamir and apprise him of the historic agreement. When we met on Sunday, I read the agreement in the ears of Shamir. Quiet, didn't answer. But the next day, without my knowledge, he sent one of his ministers to George Schultz, Secretary of State of the United States, and said that he is against the agreement. 
Schulz was under the impression that this is an agreement so comfortable for yourself, the best we could have. All of a sudden he says, well, I'm, I can't split the Israeli government. And I lost. You think it was as simple as that? <laughs> George Schultz said, well, I don't want to split the Israeli government over the issue of peace with the Jordan. Uh, this is what I said before, a hagiography. And so in other words, it's a propaganda. But nevertheless, the essential point is that there was something called the Jordanian option. And the idea was along the lines that I just said before. The problem, of course, the fundamental problem, I mean, there's a lot of problems with that. You really think there wouldn't be any issues if somebody wanted to start another settlement? You really tell me there wouldn't be an issue with the holy places, as he said before? I mean, how cretinous do you think we are? But I'm serious, you know, the first time somebody spit on a sitter or somebody spit on a Koran, you know, the war breaks out again, you understand? So, I mean, how were they going to split, for example, the higher bias? How exactly was that going to work? The Jews, I mean, this side of Kotel, they mean the other side of Kotel. Here are the Israeli soldiers, there are the Jordanian soldiers. It was really fundamentally flawed. But he, of course, didn't see it that way. The main problem uh, is that uh, it would have killed Jordan. Jordan would have become a Palestinian state. What I mean by that is it can be overthrown. Uh, let's go to the next one. Do you honestly think, I mean, King Hussein and now the new King Abdullah, the king now in Jordan, they have a hard time riding the tiger. If you know anything about Jordanian politics and a group like this is somewhat familiar with what goes on in the Middle East, uh, they got a hard time just keeping their throne. And they're constantly maneuvering back and forth, and I understand that. And really, 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 Jordan doesn't have a reason to exist. It was just the British gave that as a, you know, as a matana to that, uh, the Hashemite dynasty. So if you think they were gonna take over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and then if the Hamas or somebody else were trying to go and attack the Jews, especially if somebody made a settlement, and King Hussein's police are gonna kill them, it's not gonna to lead to a civil war in Jordan? Didn't King Hussein have a civil war in 1970 which came this close to losing everything? So, you know, it's hard to see what the logic was, but I'll tell you again, smart people obviously figured what I said was wrong, which goes to show you smart people can be wrong. Now, um, this is what, what's, I'm just going through what happened in the history. On the other hand, here's the big problem. If you kill the Jordanian option, what's your plan? Do you have a plan? The Likud thought that if they killed the Jordanian option, that would be the end of the discussion. But all it did was to activate the Arafat option. And that's what Paris was thinking about. You gotta deal with somebody. Now, they thought you don't, but if you're gonna deal with somebody, if you're not gonna deal with this one, you're gonna deal with that one. And that's why Paris now, this is obviously made before he died. He died, what, in 2016, I think? Uh, I think. So, um, you know, he's looking at it in, in that retrospective. We have to deal with Arafat, but it was up to me, you would have dealt with King Hussein. Although, it's not actually true. But the bottom line is, that is what happened, as we all know. So after the collapse of the Jordanian option in 1987, George Shultz, in 1988, who I'll say again was one of the best secretaries of state for Israel, you, that, that's a fact, he was not against Israel at all, negotiated with Arafat secretly and got him to say that the PLO charter is bottle. Because the US had committed sincerely to Israel back in the 1970s when Israel said, how can you expect us to negotiate with an organization which says it's committed to our destruction. That's like I see Algeria and Vietnam, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do what you Americans did, which you yourself know was a bad option, which was to deal with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, knowing that it's all about you know, totally defeating you. You can run back to America, we have nowhere to run to. So the Americans were macabre that particular argument. But that just means that if you're Schultz in the State Department, then you'll say to somebody like Garifat, listen, just, just, just change that clause, <laughs> you understand? Just, just don't say you're committed to destruction of Israel. That's all. It's, it's one sentence that's, that's keeping you from being a full player over here. And for years, by the way, Arafat would not change, but in 1988, so Schultz and the American uh, uh, diplomats and the Europeans and the others said do so. And so what happened? Uh, Arafat said, now he's the chairman 
of the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was a big organization, bigger than just his own faction. It was six groups. But he said, we're no longer uh, committed destruction of Israel. What about the charter that says that you are? It's like Hamas, lift of love, hefka, kafka, dara. You understand? No, it's a done, it's bottle. Uh, now, this is 1996. This is four years after 1992, when Clinton was already president, as we'll see. So they passed amendments formally to the PLO charter, although it never comes out and says we fully and totally accept Israel, but it says, and I don't know if you remember this, um, I, I'm not sure we'll get to it this year, maybe, Clinton, who followed the uh, Oslo things very closely, because that's the type of guy he was, he flew to Gaza. This is before Hamas took over Gaza. And he went there to sit there while the Palestinian Congress you know, actually said we vote this sort of thing, because they didn't want to do it, you see? And the Palestine National Council, emanating from the Declaration of Independence, blah, 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 from the resolutions, accepted the two-state solution based on introduction principles from the Oslo Agreement, but both sides put in decades of confrontation, and to live in peaceful coexistence, mutual dignity, and so forth, recognize their mutual legitimate political rights, and reaffirming, eh, and based on this, eh, we hereby say, that the National Charter is amended by canceling the articles that are contrary to the letters exchanged between PLO and Israel in, in, such and such, in, in September 9th, you know, 1993. Notice they don't come out and say, you know, it's over and we accept Israel. To use the kind of language, uh, and the Science Legal Committee to redraft the National Charter and, and present it for his central council. So he never actually did that. All I'm saying is, this type of thing that somebody like Begin, who was a lawyer, Begin was a graduate of the Harvard Law School of Poland. I mean, that's not funny, I'm serious. University of Warsaw Law School, that's what he was. Uh, therefore, care to, so he says, I want to see Baruch Bitchak Tan, as they say, where do they actually say it? Let's go on to the next page. Oh, that's the end of it. So uh, you get what I'm saying. Now, besides all the rest of it, even if Arafat swore, you know, cross my heart and hope to die, and all that kind of thing, swore in my mother's grave, you can trust him. You, know, you get what I'm saying? You can trust them. But that's what it boils down to. Now, if people like George Schultz and Ronald Reagan, who were not anti-Israel, push this, it means that what I call the Palestinian woke narrative, the PWN, penetrated everywhere, and it had. It became a truism, whether it's true or not, that you can't have a peace in the Middle East unless there's a two-state solution. That's what the bottom line. And the only counter-argument is, okay, what's your, if, if not, then what do you say? Y you understand? Now, I understand what that means, but you understand what this means. So what you're saying is that the Arab-Israeli solution has no actual, you know, real um, end. That's kind of true. Uh, but nobody wants to hear that. The reason there's no end is because they're not going to stop trying to destroy you. You see, Israel's not out to destroy them, but they're out to destroy you. That will not go away. You mean forever? I don't know forever, but for a long time. For a foreseeable future. But the counter argument said, what am I supposed to do? I gotta come up with something. No, I just told you they're never gonna stop to kill you. Yeah, but I gotta come up with something. But I just told you they're never gonna stop to kill you. And it bounces back and forth like a ping pong, as we all know. I think we all know. Now the problem is, Shamir, unlike Paris, had no charisma and didn't even try. <laughs> right? I mean, that's who he was. So in 1988, to it's interesting, by the way, the people who are close to him really like worshipped him, but that's like a dozen people. Everybody else, it was just, you know. Uh, now, in 1988, 1992, therefore, these last four years, which was basically Bush Sr., leading Jews sought to cooperate with Paris to undermine Shamir and advance this PWN, this Palestine woke narrative. Most notoriously was Edgar Bromfin, if you remember him. Since he's a billionaire, and he has his own jet, and he flew around the world, I'm very serious about this. I remember he went around in the United Nations, and Washington, and capitals around the world to try to undermine the Shamir government and bring in a Paris government through various parliamentary maneuvers. And, you know, like I say, when you're rich, you think you really know. And I must say that he had his um, executive director, uh, Dr. Singer, who was an orthodox guy, and they both were terrible. You know what I'm saying? They really undermined uh, the Israeli government. They were just terrible. That's, that's how it goes. And, you know, there's no skin off his nose. 
not that he's any kind of exemplar. You know, if you read his, you know, how many times he's been married and all of his kids are married out and this and that and the other and, the, and all the divorces and so forth. So he's not exactly what you call a model Jew, but he thought of himself that way, you see? And he thought, all these people were moved, as they say, with the best of intentions. I do mean that. But since they bought into the, you know, mainstream uh, uh, narrative, so they persuaded themselves that what they're doing is the right thing. And one day, they'll be etched in history on the Mount Rushmore of Israel as the people who, against all odds, you know, finally brought the ship home to safe waters. Uh, but they were wrong. So they were wrong. Now, worst of all, the left and even the center in Israel, in the state of Israel, embraced what I call the PWN. And all kind of establishment figures in the late 80s now broke the law because there was law in Israel saying they're forbidding contact with the PLO, including, you know, somebody was about to be president of Israel, Azar Weitzman, and all kind of professors. They started meeting with uh, official members of Arafat's uh, group. And, uh, you know, is Azar Weitzman, what are you going to do? Arrest me? You, you see what I'm saying? So the, so, so the point is that from a political perspective, Shamir you know, wasn't up to, 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 to making the case. And at the end of the day, in a democracy, uh, if the government doesn't have, shall I say, the charismatic authority and relies strictly on the institutional authority, it's no good. You understand? Because at the end of the day, there aren't enough police in Baltimore to hold down a riot. You get it? If there's not a certain charismatic authority the government has that people say, okay, this makes sense, I'm gonna do it, uh, then you're in big tsars. And I would say Shamir uh, had no charismatic authority, except among, his, except among people who believe like him anyway. So this was the problem. The problem for the left was that damn democracy. <laughs> I remember after one of the elections in Haaretz, you know, they said, some guy who was in the Labor Party at lost, he said, I want to change the electorate. <laughs> you get it? Uh, because I'm educated and you're not educated. I'm smart and you're not smart. So why should you have a vote? You see, I know what we're talking, you guys don't know what you're talking about, so why should I have a vote? It's that damn democracy, you see? Now, a majority in Israel still distrusted the Palestinian woke narrative, and they kept reelecting Likud. So Likud won to the utter frustration of all the WASP elites in Israel in 77 and 81. They sort of won in 80, sort of in 84, they won in 88. It's a whole bunch of times, okay? Now, um, and the Labor Party did not have a good shot at capturing that part of the electorate for all kinds of reasons. One of the things is that the um, Sephardim still remembered Salah Shabbati and the Mabarot, and they never got past that. And Shimon Peres, by the way, was opposed to even apologizing for it. I, I remember this very well. Uh, number two, um, they didn't trust the Palestinians. And they thought if you're going to set up a Palestinian state, whatever you call it and however you, uh, you know, make cosmetics on it, we're going to have terrorists coming to my house and shooting me in the backyard. But in 1992, things changed because for the first time in Israel, the Ruskies are a big factor. Hundreds of thousands, oh, eventually close to a million, but at that time already hundreds of thousands were pouring into Israel. And you know and I know, if a Russian Jew comes to Israel or any Jew comes to Israel, you're an instant citizen, you can vote. If me, myself, and I moved there tomorrow, provided I'd done all my paperwork, uh, but let's say I was coming from Russia, so I don't even need the paperwork, frankly. You know. So uh, if somebody today, which is Saturday, Sunday, says I'm leaving Russia or Ukraine, and I'm making Aliyah right now, as we read in the paper, some do, and the person gets off the plane, uh, they can vote on Monday or Tuesday whenever the election is. You understand? That's how it goes. You're a citizen already. So all these people showed up, and to the new Russian um, electorate who have never voted in their life, Correct? I mean, over Russia, that's not a vote. Not a real vote. Not a real vote. <laughs> right, you can vote in the Russian elections. He said, uh, you never voted before. So this is a new experience. Different parties are competing for you. And we're not talking about Salah Shabbat, they cannot read and write. They're, they're, you know, they're coming from a politically illiterate, they, they are educated. And they're coming to Israel now. Shamir seemed colorless. 
And the only thing he was capable of was blocking the Palestinian woke narrative. And there's truth in that. The right in Israel, and that's to the right of even Shamir, suffered from its usual extremism. This is an interesting phenomenon because in Israel, the right has always shot itself in the foot. I'm not sure everybody understands what I mean. Uh, until 1977, for 30 years, from 1948 to 1977, the right equaled Menachem Begin. You understand? The Heirut Party, that was the right. Uh, they wanted the uh, Eretz Yisrael Ashlema. In the early years, they even wanted Jordan, Shtega Dot Yarden. I mean, that was the right. You don't get more to the right than Menachem Begin. Uh, but when Begin gave back the Sinai, and in Yamit, in exchange for a peace treaty with Egypt, which was a real peace treaty, it's about 40 years now, 45 years, uh, some on the right saw this as a betrayal, and they formed their own parties. So in other words, now for the first time, after the 77 election, but by the 81 election, you start to have parties for whom Likud is not right enough. You get it? This is Gula, um, what's her name, Gula Kohn, and Raful Eitan, and Yuval Neman, these are all names from the past, or people held that Menachem Begin is a traitor to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, that's an interesting way of looking at things, but that's how they saw it. And they siphoned off votes. You know, they did form their parties. They're always very small parties. Now, um, the result of that is that in the nature of small parties in the Israeli parliamentary system or any kind of multi-party system, if you have small coalitions, they have a lot of power. The same way the front parties can squeeze to get what they want, the same way the right-wing parties can squeeze to get what they want. And for the right-wing parties, the whole idea is not to give in at all under any circumstances, af sha'al, as they say in Israel, not one, one inch, okay? So uh, this is, as I said before, the, the, the origin of the current uh, right-wing parties in Israel like Itamar Ben Gvir and others. In other words, he, let's get this straight, he's to the right of Bibi, you see? It's the right of Bibi, and he's saying Bibi's not uh, uh, right-wing enough. No, it's he'll give in too much to the Arabs. I just want to be clear about that. Uh, now, the same thing happened to Shamir, who was very strong on not giving anything up, but Shamir went to Madrid. If you remember, there was that first Saddam Hussein war on Bush Sr., General Schwarzkopf. And after the war was over, they had the Madrid conference, in which is supposed to be a peace conference, or at least a preliminary conference, for the first time to all the countries in the Middle East, or at least most of them should get together to talk about a final peace between uh, Israel and the Arabs. And if you remember, Shamir uh, went to the, uh, uh, and, and, and Shamir, by the way, Shamir didn't even want to go, but he did go, um, because how are you going to say you're not going to a peace conference in Madrid? As I say, he's on the extreme right over there. <laughs> and, uh, but he didn't give up anything. If you remember, I think talk about last year, he made a famous speech in which he defended the Jewish rights there. He says, oh, you know, we're not strangers here, and this is our land. Uh, you know, you have a right too, but so do we. So do we. And I don't want to hear anything from, you know, the Jews are, are colonials and this kind of junk. And, uh, and, and he insisted, you know, that when it gets down to the nitty gritty, there should be separate small, small committees, they should negotiate with each other, and nothing happened. Well, the very fact that he was willing to go to the Madrid conference, if you remember this, led the right-wing parties to bring down the government. So they could have gone another year and a half or so down to 93, but they were so angry at what he did that in a petulant way, they refused to support the government. So he had a 61 anyway, so then he didn't have a government. So they moved up the elections much quicker. And the labor one, this one I mean when I say they shot themselves in the foot. You see, extremists don't want to hear this, but they often do stupid things to themselves. Because politics is the art of the possible. And politics does involve, whether you like it or not, give and take. But they don't want to hear that. The left doesn't want to hear anything you know, on, on their principles and the right doesn't want to hear in their principles. Now, I know there are people here who disagree with me and all the rest of it, but they're just wrong. What can I tell you? <laughs> now, uh, I mean, history, sh history shows this. History shows this. I mean, what did they gain by bringing down Shamir? 
he is the most right wing, especially on the issue I'm talking about, as far as I'm aware, me, myself, and I, he's the most right wing prime minister ever Israel ever had. Okay? If you want to get down to actual positions. That's, I think the record will show that out. But he wasn't enough for them, so he shot him. That's fine. And what did you get worse? This is what I mean when you say extremists do stupid things. Now, the, the whole point of extremist politics is, no, we're the right ones, you're all stupid. But it doesn't work that way. Now, uh, so the Shamir coalition fell apart. And again, it wasn't the from parties that brought it down, but the right wing parties. And the rightist rebels in Likud, like Ariel Sharon, led to early elections. Okay? So, I mean, here, here, look. Here was the Israeli, you know the, the arithmetic, everybody's following that sort of thing. So the Likud had uh, 40, uh, the Shas, and watch this, 40, but here's the religious. It's uh, 6 and 5, gives you 51, and the uh, Maftal gives you uh, 56, and Tri is a right-wing party, that gives you 59, and Soma gives you 61, right? And maybe Maleta gives you 63. There you go, it's as simple as that. So if these guys, you see how close you were to, you know, if you, if you lose three or four, you're, you're out of business. You don't control 61. That's how it goes. So um, that's what they did. To the voters, uh, the right, especially the Ruskies, seemed in disarray, which was true. And they're coming here and said, they're like, I mean, they, can't, they don't even control their own guys. In addition to that, there was a wave of Arab stabbings. If anybody remembers the Leil Kil Shonim, where they penetrated into an army base and killed a bunch of draftees who were new Russians, and they didn't know the, you know, the basic security rules, and there was like a certain mini massacre of Israeli soldiers, okay? All this reinforced the image of a Shamir unable to control the Palestinians. The religious parties in the coalition, again, pushed the envelope too far, because they kept demanding more and more money. And this is a time when the Ruskies were coming in by hundreds of thousands. And, so, and, and they put them in caravans, if you remember, you know, in, the, in those um, trailers. And they don't want to put up with no Sal Shabbati stuff. And they need money. This is an unprecedented opportunity for Israel to absorb and provide you know, uh, uh, job programs and you know, employment and things like that. And at the same time, you know, the, the Shas and the other ones, so I guess if you don't give us more money for the yeshivas, then we're going to leave. So if you're Russian, again, I'll say it again, this is counterproductive for yourself. Because if you make yourself hated by the new mass of voters, they're going to take you down. And that's what happened. So uh, this was, the economy, by the way, was schwach. And so it was an opportunity for the Labor Party to bounce back after 15 years of being out of power. So it wasn't that they were so great, the right did a bad job on its own. And they have to acknowledge this. But Shimon Peres was the leader of the Labor Party, and he was a turn off to many, which is interesting. Well, not so interesting. He had led them to defeat in 77, in 81, in 84, sort of, and in 88. And so he had this image that, you know, he's not going to lead somebody to victory. And second of all, he tried to undermine the government like we saw last year by bribing the Shas and the others and the Agoda. That was called the Targil HaMasriach, as we talked about last year, which only Rav Shach and the Lubavitch Rebbe betrayed him at the last minute, you know. So they betrayed the betrayer, you know. And so he didn't look good in 1992. And Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, had savaged Paris over the years as we talked about. Rabin wrote several memoirs. All these guys have written several memoirs. It's interesting. You know, I'd like to do that too. And I'm serious, you know, look it up. And, uh, you know, and Rabin always saw, I guess, Paris is a backstabber and he's an intriguer and he's a liar and this and that and the other. So he really messed him up. And uh, Rabin had a better image. Let me just put it this way. I think everybody will remember this. Rabin had been the prime minister in the 1970s, right? After the Yom Kippur War. And then they found that his wife had an illegal bank account in Washington, D.C., which is wrong. It's, it's not like stealing a million dollars. I mean, he didn't say she stole any money, but she kept money in, in, in the bank, which at that time was illegal. He quit right, right then and there. He said, I did something with my wife, did something, and I quit. 
Uh, when's the last time you heard a politician do that? So he had an image of at least, you know, being honest in that way. Whereas Paris and the other guys, you know, so, um, so now Rabin got his revenge because he, and not Paris, was elected to lead the Labor Party ticket in the 1992 elections. As you see, Rabin got 41 and Paris got 40, uh, 35, which is, which is not a, a landslide, but nevertheless, he got a clear majority, so he's going to be the boss, or at least that's what he wanted. And it worked, because when the elections came, the Labor Party scored a great victory over the Likud, 44-32. to 32. The, the Likud really went down. So now, look what I'm about to show you. This is the results of the 1992 elections. 44 is very far away from 61. No, it's not. Shulamit Aloni, that's a party to the left of the Labor Party. That's, these are uh, very secularist, and they want to reform Israeli society in, in a more leftist and secular fashion. It's 12. 44 and 12, you're talking something already. That's already 56. Look how close you are to the magic number of 61. That's my point. This was a major uh, victory of the left. Not so much the Labor Party itself, but the left. If you talk about the Labor Party plus Shulam Mediloni. Okay? Now, um, on the other hand, it's a little bit funny because that's all they had. If you have, see, in Israel, it's all numbers. You know this from reading the news. 44 and 12 gives you 56. So where's the rest? You need another five. Not so posh. I mean, if you take the Arab parties, that would do the trick. That would put you 61. A guy like Yitzhak Rabin said, I don't want to be in a coalition. My government should depend on the communist Arab parties, especially at that time. That would be on the pale. He's got to figure out some way to form a government with the 56. We'd get the extra five. Okay? Now, this is you know, wonderfully uh, exquisite torture for the right. Because he got 32, but it's not so push it. 32, but look at this. 8, 6, 6, 4. So that's 12, that's 16, that's 24. So 44, 24. No, I'm wrong, right? What did I do wrong? Wait. 8, 14, and 20, and 24. Yeah, okay, and 32 and 24, that's right. So that gives you 56 also. Ah, okay, I'm not done. Um, and this guy is on the right. So what does that give you? That's it. <laughs> no farther, because the others are the left or the Arabs. So look how the right felt in 1992. <laughs> Almost there. Okay? Almost there. So which way is it going to go? Obviously, um, the religious parties in this situation cannot go with the right because they it will only get to 59. You see what I'm saying? There's no point. You only get to 59. So then they have to go... If they want anything, they have to go with Rabin. So now began a whole, um, what's the right word, negotiations with, this, well, not him. He's a right-wing party. He doesn't want it at all. Well, it's uh, the NRP, it's the Shas, it's the Aguda. Uh, I'm not sure about the NRP. They wouldn't do it either. They're very committed to Eretz Yisrael HaShlema, so they wouldn't do it. Well, guess what? 56 and 10 gives you 66. That's okay. So all you have to do is deal with the, with the, with the Shas and the Aguda. Okay, we know what that means. <laughs> okay, we know what that means. And uh, this is how the um, negotiations proceeded. Um, because it required money. Now, Rabin did want them because he figured like this. It's just a question of money. And then I can do whatever I want. As the head of the Aguda said... Now the time has come to, to, to divide up the Canadal. <laughs> you understand? Okay, that's how they talk in Tammany Hall. And so um, this is how the negotiations were supposed to proceed. And to a guy like Yitzhak Rabin, who had been in the Mapai, I'll say again, the Mapai, before it became the Labor Party, he's an old Ben Gurion guy. So uh, that was the old way that Israel was run once upon a time, which is you give the religious party some money, and they don't interfere in the foreign policy, 
and they don't interfere in the economic policy and all the rest of it. You know, just, just feed the goose, as it were. You see? Now, the interesting point is that, and believe me, if Rabin could have done that, he would have done as simple as that. The problem, the problem was the next one. Let's go to the next one. The problem was her. Okay? The uh, Shulamit Aloni is Israeli lawyer who became an activist in the Mapai part and then moved beyond, to the left of that because she was what we would call today a Chiloni consumer advocate from their point of view. I understand where she's coming from and she was a principled person in her way, but she's against the from getting all this money and a separate rabbinate and all that kind of stuff. She wants a, a secular state. And she had been, and that's a point of view, get it? No, it's a firm person at this point of view, a healing person at this point of view. That's what I'm trying to say. And, and she was honest about it, you know. And, uh, and she was very uh, vocal. Uh, if you ever read any of your books, she shows how disgusting the Orthodox are and so forth. She's got, she got plenty of evidence. Uh, and she really wanted to, from her way of thinking, which I understand, she wanted to break the terrible education system because for 15 years, the same guy had been the Minister of Education, that was the head of the Mizrahi, of the Maftal, Zvulun Hammer. Uh, when Menachem Begin was elected, Menachem Begin was a certain type of guy, and he said, I don't like this whole business of left-wing high school teachers and left-wing um, professors. Uh, they brainwash all the kids in a left-wing direction, which is not false. So um, he didn't mind at all that somebody's a kippah through go where now this guy had been in the Palmach. I mean, he was a you know a real Israeli. Uh, that the the, the the students, especially in the high schools, that's the most impressionable years. She hear a positive Israel Zionist message. What's wrong with that? Now she represented the opposite point of view. So she said, "You want me in the government, which I want to be help you begin the government. I don't want a Likud government. I want to be in charge of the schools of the education." And Rabin said, "Okay." Well, then that drove the Agoda crazy. Because to them, she's the devil, and Machshefa. And, they saw, and Rav Shach said like this, if she's going to be the Sarah Chinuch, then uh, forget it. And so there were all these complicated uh, negotiations, and it led to a Haredi crisis. Because by the time it's over, Rav Shach said, you cannot join with Rabin and form a government, but Avad Yosef said, I think you can. And they did. And so Rabin, who had, as I showed you before, 56, it's all numbers. Uh, now had 62, because the Shas is six. So 56 plus six. That's how he had the government, from the Shas party. I know it sounds a little bit funny, but that's what it is, from the Shas party. Such is the nature of Israeli politics, uh, which therefore meant, of course, that he said, Rabin, and he doesn't look too comfortable over there, but, uh, but, but, but you want to know something? You go to a Shas and you dance, you dance the dance. The, um, um, this led to a gigantic civil war in the Haredim. Okay, uh, that was not the time to be in uh, B'nai Brak and place like that, because Rav Shach basically said, "I guess you disobeyed me. I said that you shouldn't go in, and you're going in the government anyway. This means you're all treif. All the Sephardim are treif. They shall be kicked out of the Ashkenazi yeshivas. I mean, you have no idea how intense this got. And uh, Avadi Yosef was supposed to be the servant of Rav Shach, and now he was like asserting his independence." And all I can tell you is, it was a hot time in the old town tonight. And uh, if you read the old Yatayd Nehmans, if you like Lush and Hard, that's what you'll do, then um, <laughs> you'll see you know, all these terrible things they say about Avad Yosef and all the rest of it, who did not respond in the same way, which is interesting. And uh, there was a big split and there has remained. Now, later when Shach died, there was nobody like him who was as, you know, as a militant. But in that time, it was a pretty bad, and it's therefore ironic that it was uh, uh, a Haredi party which uh, enabled Rabin to have the Oslo Agreement. That's, that's the point, okay? Later, they left the government late in 93, but that's because of uh, financial scandals, not because of principled opposition to this. Now, it's very interesting. I could kick myself, but my foot is bad ever since, since uh, uh, Simchas Torah, uh, Torah Meniscus, that, because uh, I had a book in Shul and I wanted to bring it here and I, I, I forgot it. There's this great bio of, uh, of Adi Yosef 
by this uh, well-known Israeli journalist, Avishai Ben Chaim, if you know who that is. And he writes on these sorts of issues. And it's a very good book, it's 500 pages. And he has an interview, because he used to interview about Yosef. And he himself is a Moroccan guy, went to Nativ Mayor, and he says, he's got a, you know, he has a master's degree from, I don't know where, from some university in Israel. It's an interesting guy, you know, with long hair and all the rest of it. And, uh, and Avadio said, said like this, you know, I know my voters are going to be angry at us because they want us to team up with Likud. But I don't trust the right. I think they're too extreme. And I trust more like people like Paris and Rabin. And I am alienating my voters. We'll make up with them when the next time comes. Yes, and others, I'll be able to explain it to them. So, I mean, he knew exactly what he was doing. He simply didn't agree with um, the idea, at that time, with the idea that there should be an absolute uh, a veto on any kind of Palestinian state. It's just interesting. Now, later he changed his mind, as, as many did, but I'm talking about what happened at that particular moment. So you see, it's a, it's, it's, it's a strange situation, but basically this led to Rav Shach and his guys kind of excommunicating Avad Yosef. And I'll tell you again, you know, you read the things they say about him, you think he was a dumbbell. And some, instead of somebody who wrote the 60s farm or whatever, you know. Uh, so such is the nature of politics. Having formed the government, the question was now what? Now Rabin had his own ideas and Paris had his own ideas. Because they didn't like each other even though Rabin found himself compelled. If I got 41%, you got 75%, so I gotta give you a number two job, but you'll be the foreign minister. Uh, each of these guys had their own clique or clack of advisors, and they spent all their time dissing the other team. But both of them had strange ideas. If you know Rabin, his attitude was as follows. Forget the Palestinians, concentrate on the Syrians. On the Syrians. In other words, do a Begin Sadat with Hafez al-Assad. Return the Golan in exchange for a full peace. This shows you that no matter how smart somebody else, we always live within a certain framework of thought. Because uh, Rabin was a smart guy, I mean, obviously. But it's interesting, he's in prison in frame of thought. And that is, as the French used to say, some fight the last battle over and over again, uh, you know, instead of getting ready for the next battle. Begin had pulled off uh, something quite remarkable, a real honest to goodness peace treaty, you know, w with everything spelled out in exchange for returning the land that they had taken over in the Six Day War. So that becomes the way you do it. If, and I'll say again, if, let's just say for argument's sake, if Rabin would have been able to pull this off, and if Assad had been like a Sadat type, and in exchange for returning to Golan Heights, Israel would get an absolute genuine peace, all the rest of it, then Rabin bigger figure like this, then who can attack us? You, you don't have Egypt, you don't have Syria. Who's gonna attack? Jordan's not gonna attack us. The other countries are far away. You see, this is his way of thinking. It was stupid, but it was his way of thinking. And that's what I say, it's very funny. So the strategy was, you know, Syria first. This, this is still what Israel held after the Yom Kippur War. Uh, here's part of Israel. And uh, you give this back, and so what? You know, we'll go back to the old borders of Israel in, in uh, 67, but we'll have a real and genuine peace so they won't shoot down at us from the top of the high places. That's the bottom line. The problem, of course, is that, uh, is it realistic? When I say it's stupid, I'm not just tossing words around. Uh, I'll get right to it. You have a big problem, and I've talked about this in the past, but God willing, you've all forgotten. The, uh, if you it, uh, look very closely here, you have to look very closely where it says 1949 armistice agreements, and you'll know that Israel and Syria have a very unusual border, which is, I'm talking about the 67 border, in which the Syrian border stopped just before the Sea of Galilee. You understand? It's like 100 meters, how, how many feet is that? Yeah, okay, so, yeah, so you know, like that. So, which is crazy, but that has to do with the fact that the British and the French, when they ruled Palestine and Syria back in the 1920s, for their purpose, administrative purpose, just wanted to, you know, draw whatever lines they did, and 
a, a French officer and a British officer drew this line because they wanted at that time that the whole of the Sea of Galilee should be in the British Mandate of Palestine, right? After all, the French in Syria had a lot of rivers and stuff like this, and Lebanon, so what do they care? If you're a Syrian, you're like enraged over this. Who gave you the right to cut off our access to a big body of water, which really is ours, because the Syrians hold, they own everything, you know? And so in 1948-49 war, there never was really agreed by the Syrians that they should not have the right to enter here. It's just that they signed an armistice line, which means a temporary ceasefire line, but when it comes to any kind of actual political negotiation, we're going to insist that you know, that be canceled and we have access over here, we call riparian rights, to the Canaret. Israel, for its purposes, so I guess, no you don't, and we need the Canaret's are our only source of water, and the heck with Syria being on there, Plus, if they're there, they'll flood it with Syrian ships and junk like that. They'll be a nightmare, which is what they would do. So I'm simply trying to say like this. You don't have that with Egypt. It was possible. The reason Begin did a deal with Egypt because it's possible to make a chalukah. Shnai mochzim matalia chaluku. You get this part, we get this part. In Syria, it's much more messy. And you're not dealing with a benevolent government. You're dealing with Hafez al-Assad, who I think we know today based on what he did to his own people, because he killed several million of them, I'll say it again, he killed several million of them, including many of them by bombing and poison gas and tortures that I cannot describe in a synagogue. Uh, but I think those of you who follow the news will know it. So you're telling me that this is the same thing as Sadat? You would have trusted him, put him on top of the, of the Golan Heist, the guy who was running the whole drug trade in Lebanon and who knows what else, plus his son? I mean, the whole world knows this today. He's only in power because the Russians and their reign is back him. You see, his own people would like to kill him. So these are the people that, that, that uh, no, but you see, to Rabin, Egypt is a country and Syria is a country. Egypt made a peace treaty, Syria made a peace treaty. You know, it's like that. You make that kind of equation. Um, so when you get to, I mean, we know who we're dealing with over here, okay? Now, Hafez al-Assad was very different than Sadat. Sadat was what you call authoritarian, and Assad was totalitarian. Many people don't know the difference including you, but you're about to learn the difference, <laughs> right? An authoritarian regime, well, this is how they talk in poli-sci. An authoritarian regime means like this. Live your life, go to shul, have your family, go to bar mitzvah, go on vacation, stay totally out of politics. Leave that to the government. You understand? Don't even talk about politics. Right? Let, the, let, let the leaders of the country do whatever they want to do. We're not bothering you. I'll say it again. To a from Jew, you live in Lakewood, you go learn, you go after you keep Shabbos. You know, what, what, what do you care whether they pass an amendment or not? You, you see what I'm saying? Is that, that's authoritarian regime. Uh, you know, the macro decisions are, are just stay out of it. A totalitarian regime says like this, I need everybody to be an active participant in my regime. You have to say all the day long, I love you, Mrs. Hannigan, right? <laughs> Stalin is the greatest. Stalin is this. This is the, the fearless leader is number one. Everything he wants to do is number two. This country is the best country in the world. What if you say this country is, is, is better than any other country in 99 ways, it's worse than other countries in one way. You're Chayv Miso. You understand that's a totalitarian. That's what George Orwell is writing about. We demand full and active participation. So the kind of regime that Sadat had was what we call an authoritarian regime, which the Egyptians basically still do today. Who's the president of Egypt? Sisi. Who made him? The, he made himself. What does the public have to say about it? If they know what's good for them, they just shut their mouth. After all, if you run a stall or a store in Cairo, what do you care? You understand? Make your living, do what you can, enjoy your family, and die. You know? <laughs> right? Leave, leave the big things to the big guys. But in Hafez Assad, Syria, he was a Stalinist in mentality. He was a member of a small minority. I'm trying to point out that there are radical differences between the two. And a guy, I, you know, I, don't, I honestly don't think that in 1992, the Israelis understood Syria the way they had by 2002. Because the whole world learned a lot about Syria, you know, later, you see? And, uh, and therefore, uh, if you're Assad and you want a, a totalitarian regime, but everybody hates your guts. Let's go to the next one. If Syria is really not a country, 
a series of made up thing. In history, there has never been a country called Syria. Uh, that's not a rhetorical statement on my part. In, in history, there's never been an independent country called Syria. You, 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 that's a name the Greeks came up with. You, you understand? I'll say it again. You've had Shiites, Sunnis, Alawites, Druze, and popcorn. I don't know, you know, you had all kind of other stuff there. Well, you can look over here at the different ones. There are many, the this, that, and the other. And they've all lived in this huge area, and they were always part of someone else's empire. There's never been something called the Syrian national identity, which they know, of course, and hate, and therefore you have to be totalitarian. There has been a Syrian national identity, all for 10,000 years, and Syria's the greatest country in the world. No, I think Syria's the second greatest country in the world. <sighs> That's like telling your wife you're the second most beautiful person in the world. <laughs> if she says to the husband, you're the second handsomest guy, the guy was like this. That's, that's pretty good, <laughs> right? Am I right or am I wrong? Now try it the other way. You see, if you say, if you say the U.S. is the second greatest country in the world, okay. If you say Stalin's Russia is the second greatest country in the world, you see. So this is the key to understanding at a basic level. I'm not a Syrian expert. I just know the basics. But you got to know the basics, okay? And if you have all these guys in there and they all hate each other, and they certainly hate the guy who at the top, and he wants a totalitarian regime, then um, an Arab society, which is as polyglot as Syria, is not ripe for totalitarianism. It can only be enforced in sheer terror, and that's what he implemented. Actually, we discovered in the 21st century that it cannot be enforced in sheer terror. That's why he had the Syrian civil war. And the only thing they could do is bring in the Ruskies and the uh, Iranians, and they dropped, I forget what they call those gigantic bombs, remember? They blew up whole neighborhoods. What are they called? Barrel bombs. And so you know, that's how they won. And by the way, it ain't over. You know, the minute they can come bounce back, they'll bounce back. So a treaty with Assad would not be a treaty with Syria. Because sooner or later, Assad will be gone and they won't recognize it. But Rabin didn't want to see that. And finally, as I said before, Assad insisted on the Sea of Galilee. He would not make peace without it. Why would he? So he insisted on a piece of Israel. Could Israel give up such a vital peace? Do you really want, as I said, here's the, the line, right? Do you really want uh, the Syrians to go all the way up to here? Because I'll tell you right now, you'll have a Syrian fleet there, whether of uh, battleships or of uh, fishing boats, which are not fishing boats, you see? And what's Israel supposed to do? Okay, this, is, this, this is the bottom line. Um, as a result, all during the 1990s, and even afterwards, believe it or not, there were secret talks between Israel and Syria, which went nowhere. There were constant, in, in, in 92, 3, 4, 5, all these times. Uh, some people remember that there was under Clinton for a little while and under Bush a little while. Over here in Maryland, they had some kind of talk, but it went nowhere, okay? Uh, because the Syrian style of negotiating is very simple. First, agree to everything I want, and then we'll talk about whether or not the rest is there. I'm serious. They, they sat down with the Israelis and said, first you have to agree that we get to see a Galilee border. You see? And, you know, Rabin said, well, like this, like this, that, and the other. They really tried. The Israeli ingenuity was really put, I'm serious about this. They put to practice to figure out formulas that would satisfy everybody, but none of them weren't. And meanwhile, the Israelis said, well, talk about the peace side. No, no, no. We'll first agree to your behalf, you know, and then we'll talk about the peace side. So you just have different style negotiations. Everything I just said now was Rabin's personal foreign policy. This is how he ran things. He sent his own diplomats who were in his team to negotiate secretly with the Syrians here, there, and everywhere. He was determined that he, Rabin, would run the government, and Shimon Peres, who, who he had been forced to make foreign minister, would not undermine him as Peres had done in the in 1970s. At least this is how Rabin had seen things, which is why he had. Great! Okay. Yeah, <laughs> lower, lower it down. Okay. Is that true, really? Ani enavet et amasau matana koalitioni ani ekba mi yuasarim. Lachen u amar ani enavet ani evchat asarim ani ani. Well, that's a famous scene in Israeli politics, 
when they won, the night they won the 44 seats. So Rabin is the prime minister, and Shem Peretz number two. So you see right away, Rabin is, I guess, I'm in charge. I will conduct, Anaved is the navigate. He said, I will conduct the foreign, the, the coalition uh, you know, uh, uh, building, and I will decide who gets what position. So, and you see Paris going like, uh, right? So it's a little bit babyish, but you, know, but, but, but you get to, it's, it, these are famous things if you're Israeli, you know this. So anyway, it was impossible, however, for a smart and clever guy to, like Shem Paris, you couldn't shackle him and uh, you know, emasculate him or something like that. You know, he, he, he wouldn't stay. Uh, Rabin said, I guess, I'm making you minister of cocktails. He used to go to cocktail parties, you know, diplomat sessions. He wasn't that type of guy, okay? So um, Paris, who of course knew that he should have been prime minister, conceived a different uh, strategy. Because if he's in favor of the Syrians, he's in a different one. Now when I say Paris, and I mean their team. And Rabin surrounded himself with his advisors, and Shimon Peres surrounded himself with his advisors, who were all Israeli wasps, as I said before. Tel Aviv, they went to the best universities, you know, they knew how to mix drinks and so forth. Now, um, these young Israeli wasps uh, represented the new thinking, which was the Palestinian uh, woke narrative. And he was going to reenact his youth, Paris, as Ben-Gurion's wonderkind. Because he says, how can you allow 20-year-olds, uh, the 29-year-old people, to, that's what they were, you know, to run Israel's foreign policy. He said, well, I did it when I was 29, which was true. You have to understand, in the old Israel and the Ben-Gurion, a guy like Shem Paris was like 26 years old, 26 years old, without a, without a high school education, without a college education. I'm not saying he's dumb, but just, that's a fact. Uh, 26 years old, became the mankal of the Misrad Habitachon. I mean, he was director general of the Israeli defense establishment. Uh, that's the kind of guy Ben Gurion was. And so people say, oh, he's a nobody, he's a pisher, all the rest. That's not true. You know? And to tell you the truth, Paris was impressive in that role. So he felt that young people with new ideas, you know, that's the way to go. Paris, too, back in the 1950s, had been resented by the fuddy duddies. But he had done great things for Israel despite that. In other words, the whole Israeli establishment back in the 50s said, don't go for the A-bomb, it's a bad idea. But as you know, he disregarded what everybody said based on the idea that one day you'll see I was right. So now he's going to do this again. And whatever he does with Arafat, when it's all over, you'll thank me. That's the idea. The strategy, of course, as we know, involved dealing directly with Arafat and company. Okay, Lance de Boyle. The strategy was based on the assessment in 1992 that Arafat and company realized by that year that Israel was here to stay. That although the PLO hated the fact, they recognized Israel as a fact. Um, the Cold War was over. You know, uh, Arafat had backed the wrong side in the, in the Saddam Hussein War. Israel has not gone anywhere. They, like I say, whether they like it or not, they recognize there's a thing called gravity and there's a thing called Israel. And that was really dumb. That was really dumb. Uh, I mean, raise your hand if you think there's any Palestinian who is reconciled to the permanent existence of a state of Israel today. I don't see anybody raising their hand. That's, that, no, that, that, that's a, a statement. Do you know any Palestinian who says, my long-term plans that there should be in Israel 100 years from now or something like that? They don't operate that way. Parents didn't see it that way. Now, are you smarter than all these guys? It's funny how this is what makes history interesting. You see very smart people, and they were very smart people, and they knew the situation a lot better than I do. But, you know, uh, why don't you know how to tie your shoes? I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 it is strange. That's what makes history a humanistic discipline. You see how humans can, uh, can self-deceive, okay? At least in my point of view. So Paris, instead of being cautious, suspicious, and hunkered down, which is what Begin or somebody would do, he was optimistic that if a peace was achieved and the life of the Palestinians was dramatically improved, their feelings would change. That this simply means he just doesn't understand how they operate. Because if their life improves, they'll have a better chance to wipe out Israel, that's all. It's really interesting from a psychological point of view because it's the same way he didn't see that they had done anything wrong to Salah Shabbati. You get it? 
We saved him, we brought him over to Israel. It was a little bit rough in the beginning, but now it's fine. Everything's great. You know, I didn't do anything wrong. He, he did. Why don't this fine and vote for me? It, 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 as I tell you, human beings are more than just IQ. You have to understand that. Human beings are more than IQ. You and I also, we all live within certain uh, shackle frameworks. It, it, it's how people are, okay? Now, um, that's what he thought, okay? Now, uh, he figured that, he, he clearly thought that the Palestinians would look at the events of 1947, 1949 as an unfortunate blip, which we can all move past in a joint march to a glorious economic future, as if economics is everything. That's a Marxist approach. That's all about improving the lives of people and providing them with the necessities of life and even the, the luxuries of life. The Palestinians, he didn't get this, they do not want to move past the past. You understand? They don't want to move past the past. Now, maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong, but if you want to know who the person is, some rape victims want to move past the past, some do not. You see, the Palestinians, they don't. This is their identity. They see themselves as being horribly wrong. It can only be made right by destroying the people that did the stuff to them. You just have to understand, that is what it is. Now, interestingly, Arafat in 1992 was at a low point. He had been exiled to Tunis after the Lebanon War, which is far away. I don't know if you know this, but in, this is a son of a gun. In 1992, he was in a plane crash and everybody got killed except for him. Do you know that? It, it was a regular, honest crash. Nobody did it. <laughs> you know, uh, in Libya, I think it happened. And um, he was isolated because he had backed Saddam Hussein, which was the wrong side. And he was being bypassed by new groups that Israel didn't pay attention to enough at that time, and nobody did, like Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, which were just names at that time. But I think 30 years later, we have an insight that they weren't names and actually, they're more dangerous than Arafat. But nobody thought this way. Which is worse today, the West Bank or the Gaza Strip? You see what I'm saying? And again, I'm not playing fair because we have 30 years hindsight. But nevertheless, 30 years hindsight allows us to see what was going on. So, Arafat was at a low point, but a state, if he now had the possibility of getting a state, it's like Ben-Gurion, a state at any cost, because then you're a player. As long as you're not, you're just an emigre. Make any deal, make any promise, do whatever it takes to get a state. Ben-Gurion had been the same way. Back in his day, in 1949 and all that, he viewed the original borders of Israel as a springboard. Why did the Jews agree in 1947 to the United Nations Partition Resolution in which so much of Israel was given to the Arab state. So uh, I know what Ben-Gurion thought, and that is, I get to Ganeta, you know, right? which is what they did. So you don't think Arafat is less than Ben-Gurion in that? Give me the West Bank, give me the Gaza Strip, and then get to Ganeta, we'll figure something out. You see? Now, in the case of Israel, Ben-Gurion eventually changed his mind. I found a very interesting thing just two days ago. There's this very long in interview with, with Yitzhak Navon, who was Ben-Gurion's personal secretary for many years, if some people remember, on his staff. He had a small staff. And uh, a very educated Sephardi guy. He was later president of Israel. And you think the one was there in the, in the 56, you know, uh, he was one of the few people. By the way, today, October 29, I think is the anniversary of the signing campaign, I believe. And um, the, all you guys are with your, you know, uh, phones will f uh, confirm it or not. And very few people knew about it, and as I think you know, Israel occupied the Sinai Desert and then withdrew. And they also occupied the Gaza Strip, and they withdrew from that also. That's what happened. And he'll tell you, you'll listen, those ones in Hebrew will say, the general said, why are you pulling out of the Gaza Strip? He said, what are we going to do, control a million Arabs? Uh, they'll start terrorism, we'll have to start counterterrorism. it'll be a, a catastrophe for Israel, you see? Which means by 56, Ben-Gurion had modified his views. According to the right wing, Ben-Gurion was not Zionist enough, you see? But he modified his views 
This never happened with Arafat. Here, just listen to this for a second. It's a very good thing. 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 It's מפני שזה על מצד אחד זה חלק מארץ ישראל, מצד שני יש מאות אלפי פליטים, ערבים, מה אנחנו נעשה שם? אז אין להישאר. כעבור כמה חודשים אחרי המבצע, הייתה התמרמרות בצבא על ההוראה לסגת מסיני ומעזה, אז הוא הסביר להם מה עלול לקרות אם נישאר בעזה. יהיה טרור, יהיו פעולות של טרוריסטים. שם יושבים מאות אלפי פליטים מראי נפש שרואים את אדמותיהם מעובדות על ידינו. יהיינה פעולות טרור. המושל הצבאי שלנו יצטרך יום יום לראות בטרוריסטים. הדבר, וכשמסביבם תהיה אהדת העולם, זאת, זה יהפוך לקטסטרופה למדינת ישראל. אנחנו נאבד את זכות קיומנו המוסרית. בעיני העולם, אני גם לא בטוח אם לא בעיני העם היהודי. According to Arafat, a Palestinian state will be a springboard. Wherever we move, the Jews move out. See, that's the thing. If we move in the neighborhood, the others move out. If they move in our neighborhood, well, that doesn't happen. There are groups like that. And so all we have to do is start moving into the Israel part, and that itself will drive the Jews out. If we go to the beach, they won't want to go to the beach anymore. If we go in the, uh, in the boardwalk and in the streets, the Jews won't, won't, won't want to do that. And that's how we'll push them out, okay? Now, by 1992, Israel was really a liberal state, and the Arabs can go wherever they want. Under Ben-Gurion's time, Israel was kind of an apartheid state because under the Mimshal at Tzvayi, when they had the military government, an Arab couldn't typically go into Tel Aviv without a special pass and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it wasn't exactly apartheid state, I get that, but it was much more so. That was one of the reasons for having apartheid state. But Israel's too democratic to keep that up. By the 60s, they got rid of that because it was anti-democratic, you see? And so for Arafat, uh, let's start the negotiations, but the end result is not a two-state solution, okay? So uh, by the way, I hope on my trip in January, one of the things we're gonna do, planning is uh, to go to uh, Lud, which is a mixed city of uh, Jews and Arabs. And if you remember, they had big riots there last year during that uh, whole violent uh, episode. And they have what they call a Garin Torani, which is a uh, group of uh, Kippasru God guys and girls who, uh, who are settling there to try to be mechazik, the Jewish presence in the city. Otherwise, the Arabs would drive them out. That's a city within Israel. So you have not only, quote unquote, strife with the Arabs over the Green Line, but you have a plenty of it in the Green Line. I don't think most people know it, which is why I want to do that on my trip. So when Paris's team back in 1992 conducted secret negotiations in Oslo, the two sides had different expectations. The Israelis said this will lead to a final peace and we'll have our side and you'll have your side and the Arabs thought differently as you know. In addition, there were some territorial things that cannot be agreed upon. Uh, not yet, uh, but, but they were in the works. First of all, this crazy Danzig corridor between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Uh, if you know how World War II started, uh, Hitler invaded Poland because in after World War II, Listen closely, I'm gonna say this once, and I'm not gonna do a synopsis. He says, listen here. There used to be, this, this is the Baltic Sea. Like I say, I'm gonna say it once. This is the Baltic Sea, it's Lithuania and, and used to be Germany, like I'm doing here. But when Poland became an independent country after the First World War, the Versailles Conference, Poland said, we have no access to the sea. This is all Germany, Prussia. And so the League of Nations said, okay, We'll give you a chalik, a corridor, see that? So look, if I'm German, I'm here, but here, then I have to go through Poland then I have to get to the other side, which is Germany. 
Does that make sense what I'm saying? It makes sense, it just doesn't make sense. No, but it's, it's, yeah, but it's called the Danzig Corridor, look it up. Yeah, this is, this is the city of Danzig, which is a free city. This is how Hitler started World War II. Because he said to Poland, give me this so we'll have a contiguous business over here. And Poland said, no, no, no. And Hitler invaded them, and England and France went to war to defend Poland. That's how World War II started. So in other words, it was an inherently unstable situation, which you can understand, because you, you have a house, but I have, <laughs> you know, uh, 10 meters of my thing going right through your house. You see, and I can go in there anytime, it's mine. So, wait a minute. You know, here's the West Bank, here's the Gaza Strip. That's supposed to be the Palestinian state. Uh, how are they connected? We want a line, like that. This will be a road that is Palestinian territory. Or this way, or this, you know, wherever you cut the road. Let's say over here, that's the shortest, right? So you're in Israel, but here's the, here's the Palestinian road, then they own that. Now, believe it or not, so no, let's put it this way. You really want to introduce this potential firecracker into a permanent peace settlement? I want you to understand, Ben-Gurion was willing to do that in 1951. Ben-Gurion Shabbat was King Abdullah. When they were negotiating these secret things, there was a time Abdullah was killed. But before he was killed, Abdullah I, before he was killed, they were talking about doing exactly what I'm saying, which is give him the Gaza Strip and give a road, you see, through, 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 uh, through Israel. So they're crazy. Finally, how are you going to agree with Arafat over Yerushalayim? I want to hear how that goes. You understand? Are you really going to have East Jerusalem as a PLO state? Um, tell me what your plans are for the higher bias. You follow? Now, Paris and company were not religious. That's true. And they weren't sensitive to those issues at that time. For a real peace process, they'll give up everything. So this is, this is an interesting question I'm about to say. And take this seriously. Suppose I told you that in exchange for a real, 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 real peace, you have to give up the Kotel and the whole nine yards and go back to the borders that you had before 1967. Not, with that, not that they'll have, you know, like the Mandelbaum Gate and they'll shoot at each other and all that. Uh, let's just pretend for a minute. A real peace, and this will be the Jordan or the Palestinian part of Jerusalem, and this will be the Jewish part of Jerusalem. So um, if you want to go to the Kotel, you have to go through Palestinian territory. Would you agree to that? Well, let me put it this way. Can you understand there'd be two sides to that, uh, uh, two opinions on that subject? You can understand there'd be two opinions on that subject, but religious people or anybody with, with semi-religious feelings would be really bothered by that. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? But not, uh, not these guys, because we got along very fine until 1967 in their mind. And if it's a real peace, I, it all depends if it's a real peace. But if it's a real peace, what the heck? So um, this is what was going on over here. Now, Paris was not a religious guy. His team was not religious. But Arafat was, and he and the Palestinians are very sensitive to religious Islamic feelings. And so he demands every inch of the Harabayas as a matter of principles. principle. The two negotiating teams were not evenly matched. Uh, Paris's main guy was Yossi Balin, who has just a complicated past. This I got straight up just off the Wikipedia. He was raised in Tel Aviv in a liberal household. At the age of our mitzvah, he decided to become a relig rel rigorously religious life, but not with a yarmulke. Then he started Herzl Gymnasium School, which is not where you go if you're re re rigorously religious. In the IDF, he served in Signal Corps and served over here in Yom Kippur where he served in the army. The trauma of the war shook his faith and he stopped living a religious lifestyle. And then 10 years later, he's in charge of a team negotiating um, the most sacred place in Judaism with the Arafat team. You see where I'm going with this. I, I hope you do, anyway. And so, um, as it turned out, the two sides could not agree on Yerushalayim. For now. But every intelligent person could see which way things are heading. Because you're going to have to give in to them if you want a peace. The biggest flaw, beyond anything I just mentioned before, had of course to do with the fact that Arafat and company were not, I repeat, were not willing in the 1992 negotiations to renounce the right of return. He finesses, he BSs, he this, that, and the other, but they, they wouldn't say it nor have they today. It's a matter of principle with them that all the Arabs who lived there in 48 and their descendants can go back to Israel, which means you wipe out Israel. 
that's not my problem. You see? Well, but it's my problem. Right? So in other words, let's put it this way. This should be the most important issue from Israel's point of view, from a security point of view. Much more important than the Kotel. Agreed? From the security point of view. If you have millions and millions of Arabs moving to Israel proper. Now, the lack of agreement on such core issues did not prevent Paris and company from proceeding with negotiations. That's not who he was to the day he died. If he had an impossible situation, he would say, let's work around it. This is very different than Begin or Shamir, somebody like that, which is, we've run to an impasse. Paris was like this, we're not being creative enough. It's a certain way of thinking. He simply negotiated around those issues, leaving them for a future stage. This is, reflects his style and optimistic personality, in which a no agreement is worse than a bad agreement. I don't know if you agree with that. Is a no agreement worse than a bad agreement? Because a bad agreement can always be fixed and, and be proven in the future. Now, in my opinion, this is a terrible idea. To use Baltimore language, who wants to hire a plumber or a car mechanic without asking him about the price? <laughs> you know the price beforehand? <laughs> don't, don't be surprised for what happens. It's your own fault. And so we're going to have a state or semi-state. Uh, Yerushalayim is for future discussions, all the rest of it. The Harabais is for future discussions. The right of return is for future discussions. You know, we're living in la-la land. I mean, I mean, you know what the other side's going to do. Be because, because if you were the lawyer for the other side, that's what you would advise them to do. Agreed? Here they were giving the PLO something for nothing and hoping that in the future the PLO would prove more reasonable on these core intractable issues. They haven't in 30 years. Why should they? I wouldn't if I were them. I mean, I wouldn't if I were them. Why should they? So this is the opposite of Menachem Begin at Camp David, who drove everybody crazy, who got trashed in the WASP media and the WASP memoirs, but who triumphed in the end. I was really surprised. I just found this the other day. There's an article in 83 from William Quant. I don't know if anybody remembers that name. He was on the uh, State Department team and, uh, under Nixon, Ford, and, and Carter. He was a Middle East expert. He was at Camp David. And Begin left office in disgrace, as you will recall. And he, and I was, frankly, I was shocked. And he's a real WASP State Department type. And he said, actually, Begin was master at negotiations. Because the fact of the matter is he got everything he wanted at Camp David. And he didn't give up anything he wanted to give up. And there's a whole article along this in the Brookings Institute Review. <laughs> you see? So in other words, he's giving an objective, dispassionate uh, evaluation of Menachem Begin, who I'm sure he hated as a person. But just, you know, since it's in Brookings Institution, for those of you who want to be negotiators and diplomats, the guy pulled it off. You see? Which is not the image that most people would think of today. I want to repeat, this is from an enemy. You know, how does King Solomon say, Namon and Pitse Oyev? Faithful are the wounds of an enemy. You see? Uh, anyway, so this is not how Begin did it. But the style of Rabin in Paris had been formed in the 1970s in the Kissinger era, when you had various disengagement agreements, which in the end worked out. If you remember, people made these complaints when Israel had the first partial disengagement agreement after the Yom Kippur War, and they pulled out a few miles from the Suez Canal. And then they had the second disengagement agreement in 1975, and they pulled out of half the Sinai. And they had a disengagement agreement which they gave up a few miles to the Syrians. And people were saying at that time, but you don't know what the end is. Where's it going to go? And it worked out. We got a peace treaty with Egypt in the end. So here also, it'll work out. We'll get a peace treaty with Arafat and the Palestinians in the end. Uh, I hear. But did this work out in 1993 when the peace agreement was signed on the White House lawn? I mean, it's a pretty picture. I get that. But the truth of the matter is, uh, Paris's inexperienced team, because these were not veteran diplomats. I want to emphasize it again. He considered them to be the fuddy-duddies. People like Uri Savir and Yossi Balin and these other guys, they were, uh, you know, uh, intelligent, well-educated members of the young, upcoming generation who in the future will be uh, diplomats, you know. Uh, their inexperienced team were out-negotiated by Arafat's much more experienced team. Now, in the event, it's 30 years later, looking back over 30 years, 
things did not exactly turn out the way Arafat had envisioned. At the end of the day, as Rav Hutner used to say, generally speaking, the Rav Shalom runs the world. You know, and that works out exactly as you're going to think. So Israel actually for it into an agreement which sort of met Israel's goals because things didn't turn out exactly the way any negotiators foresaw it. Uh, it did save Israeli GIs for having the daily patrol, Nablus and Tolkarim and Gaza and all those kind of places, which really wore down in an attrition type of way, had a Vietnam type a syndrome on um, the Israeli GIs, and that was a major consideration of Yitzhak Rabin. That's his major reason for going along with this. He had been a general, he had been a soldier, he understood that it's very bad that psychologically it can, it can wear you down, and there's truth to that. Okay, so far, 30 years later, there has not been a full-blown PLO state because if there was another PLO state, you'd have a second Gaza Strip. Okay, um, as you see, so in other words, it didn't exactly develop the way it did, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that after Oslo, they kept voting in right-wing governments. You know, if, if BB wins, I don't know what's going to be. Nobody knows. It'll be because people are thinking along these lines that I just outlined tonight. And what a mistake we made in 92. Of course, the other side will say, well, what's your alternative? You know, and it goes on and on. As you see, I spent a lot of time tonight giving my highly opinionated analysis of the Oslo Agreement. The hour is late. We'll go into the details and the play out next time, and therefore I wish you good night. <laughs>